Now, we are uh, going to be hearing about conservation agriculture, improving soil health and human nutrition in uncertain environments from Neil Miller, who is with ECHO, or is a, consulting with ECHO and the Canadian uh, Food Grains Bank. He has 35 years of work experience with small scale farmers and um, was once the executive director of World Hunger Relief um, for 10 years. So, anyway, here's Dr. Miller, Mr. Miller. Thank you. I think I'll, think I'll move around a little bit as I speak. Um, nope. So I work, as, as was mentioned, um, through ECHO with a group called the Canadian Food Grains Bank. And CFGB, some of you are familiar with, is actually a consortium of many different organizations. Um, my job is to support, as a technical resource, conservation agriculture projects throughout Eastern Africa. But CFGB has other projects, uh, conservation agriculture projects throughout the continent, primarily in Eastern and Southern Africa, and just a couple in Western Africa as well. So I have a counterpart who works out of South Africa, another one who works out of Kigali, and then um, three other technical specialists who work as part of a scale-up project um, that began three years ago in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania. So all together, we work with about 37 different um, projects which include some aspect of conservation agriculture throughout the continent of Africa. Um, these projects are implemented by primarily by African NGOs, small NGOs, many of them church-based, some of whom are here, I believe. We have people from AICT Mara and um, Geita, I think maybe DCT and Dodoma. Are you, are, are, go ahead and stand up. If you're associated with one of the CFGB projects, um, please stand. And I think from Kenya also, we have ADS Western. So these are the people who are in the field doing the real work. I just get to learn from them, and it's a, it's a great privilege to work beside them. There are, of the projects here in, in, on the African continent, there are about 10 different Canadian organizations who also are involved in supporting this CA work. Um, one of them is here, World Renew, Stefan Lutz, I think Stefan must be outside drinking tea still, um, has been involved um, with World Renew support of some of these projects as well. So we thank our Canadian partners as well as our African partners. All together, we currently work with around um, or have trained around 45,000 farmers as a part of these projects. We estimate that out of those 45,000, about 37,000 are actually using conservation agriculture. And we have, um, our best estimate is around 7,000 farmers who we haven't trained, but who have observed these other farmers using CA and have decided they want to implement CA as well, um, even though they weren't trained. And probably this number of spontaneous adopters is probably much higher than that. It's just very difficult for us to track it. So this is kind of the scope of the work that I, I do. And as I mentioned, I don't work with all 37 of these projects, but I work with a subset here primarily Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. So I'm going to, first of all, review some of the principles of conservation agriculture, just because I'm not certain how familiar people are with CA. So I'll go through that. Then I'd like to talk about a couple of key strategies, and these are the real take-home points for you related to um, climate resilience or drought resilience and nutritional diversity or nutritional um, security. And then I'd like to just tell one story from here in Tanzania, a project that I, I ha worked with in the past um, that sort of illustrates 
or, or brings together these concepts. And let me say that I am usually when I, when I teach or when I talk, I have people asking me questions. And so please don't wait until the end of my talk. If, you, if there's something that you don't understand or you don't agree with, please speak up now as I'm, as I'm going. And I would much rather have you um, tell me now than to finish the talk and then realize the whole time you didn't understand what I was saying. So feel free to speak up as I go. So conservation agriculture, um, we generally speak of three principles. The first is that we want to maintain permanent soil cover. And I'm going to illustrate each of these principles in a bit. The second is that we minimize soil disturbance, so no plowing of soils. And the third is that we diversify crop associations and also crop rotations. This is kind of the, a classic definition. Um, FAO has sort of championed this definition of conservation agriculture. Others have tried to broaden it a bit. Um, but at the very minimum, these three principles, these three elements are part of what we do when we, talk, when we say we're implementing conservation agriculture. First of all, maintaining soil cover. So as I was growing up um, and in the early part of my career, I believed firmly that a good farmer is a farmer who, when he or she plants his crop or her crop, the soil is completely bare. We, we would talk about clean seed beds as being the ideal thing for a good farmer. In the 35 years that I've been working in agriculture, that has changed completely. We now know that a good farmer is not a farmer who leaves his field or her field bare, but rather a farmer who has what in the old days I would have called trash. Now we call it residue because that's a kinder term. <laughs> so we want our soils to be covered either with dead plant material or with living plants throughout the year. One of the main benefits of keeping soils covered is moisture retention. So this is a picture I took in Uganda. This maize has just germinated and it's, it's suffering se severely from um, lack of moisture. Just about two meters to the side of the, of the first plant I took this picture. And this was a, a, a project where they were planting CA plots with a, a conventional farm um, control beside it. And as you can see, these, these plants are not suffering at all because the mulch around them, the soil cover, held in the moisture so that these maize plants could continue to grow when these were suffering. Now we think about, um, when you think about soil cover, the first thing that you assume is that evaporation is less from the soil surface, and that's very true. But there are other mechanisms that soil cover um, provide in order to improve um, moisture retention and, and moisture status of soils. Reduced evaporation is one. The other is reduced runoff. When we keep soils covered, when there is mulch on soils, the rain falls and instead of running off the field, it enters into the soil. And so the combination of re reduced evaporation and reduced runoff leads to greater soil moisture throughout the growing season. And this is a huge benefit, especially in the uncertain and droughty climates that we're talking about here at this conference. This is just a study from some years back showing with zero tillage, which would be conservation agriculture, and with plowing, from May through September, what is the um, available water in the soil? And you can see with zero tillage throughout the season, at, at the beginning of the season, um, the two are the same. But as the season progresses, we lose soil moisture in the plowed ground. 
Whereas in the zero tiller, the conservation agriculture throughout the season, we have better soil moisture status. So extremely important from a standpoint of, of um, soil moisture retention. Reduced erosion is another big impact of keeping soils covered. So this is a mulching rate in tons per hectare. Um, we would recommend a minimum of around three tons per hectare of soil cover. And the graph here shows um, reduction in soil loss based on, so this would be zero soil cover. And you can see the soil loss is on the, on the order of two to three and a half tons per hectare with three tons of mulch. And I'll show you what three tons of mulch looks like in a little bit. But we have dropped that erosion down to about one ton. Three tons of mulch is not a lot of mulch, but it has a big impact on controlling soil erosion. So how much is enough soil cover? Um, I took this picture in one of the ADS projects. There's Stefan. <laughs> and I wish I could say that every farmer that we have that's implementing conservation agriculture has covered their fields to this extent. But I would be lying if I told you that. This man was an early adopter. And in fact, his neighbors were burning their maize residue. Whoops. Giving away the secret. OK. His neighbors were burning their maize residue. And so he just went and he said, can I have your maize stalks? And he took the stover and covered this field um, fully with maize. And now he'll plant in the, in the areas between where he's put the maize stalks. For most farmers, they don't have this much residue um, to cover their fields. So we talk about a minimum soil cover um, that, that brings benefits as being about 30%. This is 10% soil cover. And you can see there's some residue, but most of the soil, <laughs> most of the soil um, is still bare and exposed. So that's not enough. So in, at 60% soil cover, most of the soil does have residue. And this is great. But to gain the benefits of moisture retention, soil re uh, erosion reduction, we say the, minim that we, the minimum cover that we want to have throughout the year is about 30%. And that includes both dead plant residues and also living plants, 30% cover with, with those two sources. The second principle we talked about was minimizing soil disturbance, or you can say minimizing tillage, although FAO gets upset when you say minimum tillage. They like minimum soil disturbance. <laughs> um, but basically what it means is that instead of plowing the whole soil surface, we only use tillage where we're going to plant our seed. So this field will be planted to maize, and they've only tilled in the planting stations where the maize seed will be planted. Between, the soil is undisturbed. And you can see the residue from last year's crop remains covering the soil, protecting the soil. What about the weeds? Do you talk about weeds Yeah, so there are weeds here. And it varies from location to location. We do sometimes um, use herbicides. The majority of the projects that we work with, however, either don't have access to herbicides or the farmers feel they simply can't afford them. And they will do some light tillage with a hoe, just shallow tillage, to take out these weeds before planting. So definitely you need to take care of those weeds. So plowing. Many people don't understand that when we plow a field, what we're doing is we're introducing oxygen into the soil. And as we introduce oxygen, the organic materials that are in that soil begin to break down. We call it mineralization. So they're converted from organic form to mineral form. 
and in that form they're available to plants. So when you plow, you get a flush of biological activity and mineralization. But what happens is if you re plow repeatedly for years and years, and in Ethiopia, farmers often pl will plow even six or eight times each season before planting. And each time you're introducing oxygen into that field, it's like you lit a fire and you're burning up the organic matter that's in that field. So initially you get a, a flush of, of biological activity and nutrient release, but over time what you do is you deplete um, both organic matter, nutrient content, and biological activity. And you end up with landscapes that look like this, which is also in Ethiopia. Barren and unproductive. There are a number of ways that we can achieve this. So I showed you a picture of um, these planting basins, which were dug with a, a hoe, a narrow hoe. We can also do it with oxen, with a ripper, which is basically a plow point that you put on a moldboard plow, um, which instead of turning the soil, it just loosens the soil where you're going to plant your crop. You can also do it with tractors. So this is a tractor-drawn ripper um, that digs two furrows at a go. The challenge with both the tractor-drawn rippers and the ox-drawn rippers um, often is cost. Um, a tractor-drawn implement like this will cost around $2,000, $3,000, depending on the manufacturer. An ox drawn ripper, these, these ripper points can be um, put on a moldboard plow. You just remove the, the moldboard point and you put this on. But it costs about $50, or the equivalent of $50, to buy this point. So we're working on some. On the power tiller, yes, there are, there are ripper, ripper attachments for two-wheel tractors as well. Yeah. Challenge oftentimes is cost, and one of the things we're doing um, with Echo, Harold Msanya, who is, he was here yesterday, I think he's not here this morning, is working on adapting a traditional Ethiopian plow called a maresha to do the same thing that this does. The difference being, can you try and click that and see if it works? <laughs> eh. Try again. It's not going to work. I'm Mr. Bean. It's not going to work. All right. Uh, that's a little video, but basically this traditional Ethiopian plow can be adapted to do the ripping like, like this tool, but the difference is the only thing that the farmer needs to buy is a metal... <laughs> uh, let's, let's just leave it. We'll, we'll mess around with it. Um, so the total cost of the farmer is more like 5 to $10 with a maresha because the only thing they need to buy is the metal point, and a local fundi can make those. In, in Ethiopia, they sell for between 5 and $10, um, and the rest of the, of the plow um, is wooden, and, and local farmers can make it themselves. <coughs> 